Hello everyone. Good morning. So as you know, we we started to this checklist in the previous class, and today we are gonna finish it, inshallah. But before that, I'm going to quickly recap some of the points that I covered the last time. Because you know, uh, revision is always a good practice. Okay, so uh, revision is another step towards perfection, and also it's a kind of testing your semi-long term memory. It's a good chance also to add some additional information on the points I already covered in the last class. So we started by talking about observation or inspection. And don't forget the age of the patient, all right? And we mentioned some points. Uh, I focused the last time on eyebrows. And I talked about three important points in relevance to this. Number one is the level or the height. So we may have like, a high eyebrow due to frontalis overaction in order to alleviate the tosis. Or we may have uh, tosis of the eyebrow, like in cases of Bell's palsy or in general lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy. And this is a cause for pseudotosis, although it might be associated with true tosis. And then we talked about the contour, but this is going to be a quiz in the next class. And finally, we talked about scars, there might be stitches or stitch granuloma, who knows? So in this photo, uh, there is scars of previous frontal suspension here above the eyebrow and here in the middle above the eyebrow. But I want to add another point regarding to this observation. Be careful of two important things. First one, ptosis is just a part of a component. Uh, it's not the only sign in the case. I will explain this in a moment. The second part is that ptosis is the primary problem in this case or not. Let's discuss one by one. Ptosis is just a part of a component. Okay, so imagine you have a case like this in the oculoplastic station or even a photo in Viva. Do you think is it enough to mention to the examiner this is a case of ptosis, even if you mentioned some additional information, like this is a bilateral symmetrical ptosis, severe ptosis with uh, absent eye crease, I expect poor levator function, and also we have overaction of the frontalis, we have eye, high arched eyebrows, and you may add by adding there is an epicanthus inversus here and here, okay? Do you think is it enough? Do you think it's a complete answer? or incomplete answer. You picked all the signs, actually. You picked ptosis, epicanthus inversus, severe ptosis. You have already described all the signs. Do you think the examiner will be satisfied? No, usually the examiner will give you a clue to give an, another answer. So what do you think is the key answer in this uh, case? Like, what should be the answer here? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you may start by describing the findings, but you have at the end to tell the examiner about the diagnosis because this is a, like a pathognomonic feature. Pathognomonic feature, it means uh, we have a, like a single diagnosis answer. So this is a case, this child has a diagnosis of blepharophimosis. You can say blepharophimosis syndrome, but in recent references, the full name is like this, blepharophimosis, ptosis, epicanthus inversus syndrome, all right? Blepharophimosis, phimosis means shortage because here uh, in this syndrome, we have small widths of the palpebral fissure. So remember in the previous class, when we talked about inspection and measurements of the uh, horizontal palpebral fissure, I said it's really important in case of blepharophimosis because in blepharophimosis, the horizontal palpebral fissure is small. So everything is small, the horizontal and also the vertical palpebral fissure because of ptosis. And we have also uh, epicanthus inversus, because here the epicanthus fold is coming from down towards upward. And additional feature is telecanthus, but telecanthus is not in the name, but it is in the description of the syndrome. And this photo from Kaniski, and you know, Kaniski is genius when it comes to photos, because he wants to remind you of the mode of inheritance of Belifervimos syndrome. So do you know the mode of inheritance? So whenever we have a father and son, any offspring, you may think of what? What do you think? Yeah, it's autosomal dominant. So be careful. Yeah, if you say uh, tosis is correct, but it's not enough. It's just a part of a component, like peliferophormosis syndrome. So this is an autosomal dominant syndrome. Second thing, 
uh, sometimes you may get in the clinical station like a very old patient. So what do you expect in old age? A lot of involutional changes like redundancy, dermatocalysis, ptosis, involutional ptosis is part of involutional changes. So if you see here, yeah, the left eye, there is somehow mild to moderate ptosis on the left side uh, and might be mild on the right side with frontal overaction, high arched eyebrows. But do you think this is the actual problem? Do you think examiners brought this case to you because of ptosis? And this scenario actually is based from one of recent past candidate experience. And unfortunately, the candidate failed that station because the candidate picked only ptosis and started assessing uh, the patient like uh, motion reflex distance, degree of ptosis, levator function, and so on. And finally, the examiner told her that uh, ptosis is not his problem, but after the time is already run out. Yes, exactly. So here, if you notice there is redness of the eye, ptosis doesn't lead to a red eye. And if you uh, look closer, let's see, magnify this one, there is entropion. And if you know, uh, one of the causes of entropion is involutional entropion or spastic entropion. So here's entropion with rubbing of the eyelashes against the conjunctiva causing red eye. Yeah, if you say to this, this is like an extra information and I think it doesn't count anything to the examiner, but he is waiting for picking this entropion. And by the way, it's not enough to say entropion. Uh, when it comes to things like ptosis, entropion, ectropion, you have to say the etiology. Uh, so usually the scenario is like this. You have to uh, mention to the examiner what could be the etiology for this uh, condition. Uh, by the way, we will usually say you start the examination by inspecting the patient. But uh, these points are in your mind, actually in your mind. So you don't tell the examiner, I am going to inspect uh, blah, blah, blah. You are not narrate or like verbally uh, mention the points to be assessed. These points are in your mind, but you tell the examiner only the signs present in the patient. All right. So never, ever memorize points that are not present in the patient. Don't say to the examiner, I'm going to inspect for the eyebrow, the eyelid, uh, proptosis. You need to uh, spend like few seconds inspect silently looking at the patient and then mention the positive signs and start the examination itself, like measurement and so on. And that's why I brought this vector because these points are in your mind, in the back of your mind. Then measurements. And again, it's like plural measurements. Usually in every book, you will see the two important points, degree of ptosis and levator function assessment. Degree of ptosis, we need the pen torch. But I told you uh, before, since you are holding the pen torch, spend like a second just to comment on the Hirschberg reflex. Again, Hirschberg reflex, because someone asked this question uh, so what, are, what is the instruction? Uh, do you need to ask the patient to look at the pen torch? Definitely, yes. Okay, the Hirschberg is based on this uh, instruction. You should have pen torch. Of course, a working pen torch with a light. So it's not any target. You need a light, okay? You need the light from a pen torch. It could be small pen torch. Or it could be large torch. It doesn't matter really, but uh, I prefer small one, like pen torch. And you have to ask the patient to look at the pen torch. And notice the cornea reflection. Okay, uh, in practice, we usually do Hirschberg while, while sitting, but in oculoplastic stations, based on my experience, I was standing all the time. Okay, so, um, and you have to no carefully notice the position of the corner reflection, the first Purkinje image. If it is in the center of the pupil, in the pupil of each eye, this means there is no manifest, there is no manifest strabismus at that point at that distance. So let's recap the information once more. We have patient instruction here. Look at the pin torch or the light of the pin torch and it should be at the primary position. What shall you do? You should notice the location of the first Purkinje image. Uh, we can say corneal light reflex or corneal reflection in both eyes. What are the requirements here? Only one tool, which is pin torch, and it should be working pin torch. And some advice to have like two pin torch in your exam, because there might be one is not working. Uh, I don't know, but uh, usually we need two pin torch in the exam. Or maybe you lend other candidate one of them. Okay, and 
one important point to notice because some learners uh, might get confused between Hirschberg reflex or Hirschberg test and corneal reflection tests. There is a big heading in strabismus called corneal reflection tests. Okay, these tests are based on holding a pen torch, but the instruction to the patient may vary. But if you are going to do Hirschberg reflex or Hirschberg test, you have to ask the patient to look at the pen torch at the primary position, as I just mentioned. So after you do Hirschberg, you measure the MRD one. So it doesn't matter is it a transparent ruler or opaque one. Try to keep it just in the middle of the fissure in coaptation with uh, reflex and measure the distance between the reflex and the upper lid margin. It doesn't necessarily to be to opposite to the zero, but you have to be careful how many uh, millimeters between the core reflection and the upper lid margin. So you may place the zero opposite to the core reflection. It's okay. But if you are going to place like opposite to uh, one, yeah, you count the number of millimeters between one and the upper lid margin. So because sometimes in some references, you may find the examiner putting the ruler by different ways. So it doesn't necessarily to be opposite to zero. And in some photos, you may find the examiner uh, is placing the ruler like a wave. But if so, uh, you have to measure also the distance between the corner reflex, like here, and the lid, upper lid margin. Okay, how many millimeters? Because if you're going to measure between the corner reflex and the lid margin here, it would be smaller. And this is like an error, a big error. You have to measure between the corner reflex here and the upper lid margin here, just above it, because this is the maximum width. So this is how we measure the margin reflex distance. I told you there are two methods. The second one uh, is the more accurate, especially if we have like frontalis over action and high arched brow. In such a case, uh, we need to do additional steps before measuring the margin reflex distance. First, we need to ask the patient to look down. Why we do that? Because if the patient looks down, there is relaxation of the frontalis muscle and also the levator, by the way. Okay, so the first step, ask the patient to look down and then place your thumb over the eyebrow while the patient is looking down. So what is the aim of this? To mitigate the action of frontalis. The third step, ask the patient to look at the primary position at the pen torch and then measure the MRD one. So again, as you can see in these screenshots, ask the patient to look down to relax the frontalis. All right. And then while the patient is looking down, place your thumb on the eyebrow to mitigate the action of frontalis. And then uh, ask the patient to look at the pen torch at the primary position and measure the margin reflex distance. But here we need a third hand. So that's why it's a bit difficult, but more accurate. So we have two ways to measure the MRD one. One is simple and easy, just to ask a patient to look at pen torch and measure the distance. And it should be in millimeters. And you have to do the measurement in both sides, of course. And the other one with mitigation of the action of frontalis. All right. So this is an important slide. I wrote it down as a comparison because sometimes we learn more when we have like a comparison, like in a table or something like this. By the way, you can do screenshots whenever you watch a video, any video or like any presentation and you find like an interesting slide or, or important slide, you can screenshot and make it in a folder on your phone as a tool to revise them later. Okay. So instead of go back to the video and spend a lot of time watching the video for a second time, you can like screenshot the important clips and keep it in your folder, something like that. Uh, be careful that all the measurement of MRD1 and MRD2 and vertical pecker pressure, it should be in the primary position, provided that we have central Hirschberg reflex. And we mentioned that MRD1 doesn't equal degree of ptosis. In order to estimate the degree of ptosis, we subtract the margin reflex distance in the patient from the normal value. And we uh, said that for simplicity, we consider the normal value is four millimeters. And you have to know the grades. We have mild ptosis, moderate, and severe. Moderate ptosis is like three millimeter of ptosis. So this is the degree of ptosis, not the MRD1. And if the degree of ptosis is less than three millimeters, this is called mild. Severe ptosis more than three millimeters. Remember this slide?
uh, I said in the previous class that we might consider the left eyelid is the normal, like this is the normal reference, like 3.5. So what is the degree of tools on the right side? So if you subtract 0.5 from 3.5, we have like 3 millimeters. So this is called the moderate process. But there is another more accurate answer. We can use the normal reference of MRD1 as 4 millimeters. So in such a case, if subtract 0.5 from 4, we have 3.5 millimeters on the right side. So this is the severe tosis on the right side. And we have mild tosis on the left side. And definitely this is like an evolutional tosis because of the age of the patient, most probably. By the way, you have to mention the degree of tosis in millimeters. So you have to add here millimeters and mention the grade like severe or mild or moderate. This is how we document the finding. The second important step in measurement is to measure the levator function. And we said uh, it's better to say upper eyelid excursion. Here we ask the patient to look down. Again. So remember, look down. Place the thumb on the eyebrow while the patient is looking down. Here we need a ruler because we are going to measure. Okay, I forgot to mention that we need also a ruler in the MRD one. So the tools actually pen torch and ruler. So we need to place the ruler and keep your hand still. And then ask the patient to look at extreme up and measure the amount of the excursion of the upper eyelid. And you have to do the same on the other side. Pen torch is not required. And I told you before, if you uh, place your thumb on the eyebrow, focus on the medial two thirds and don't change the eyebrow position. Don't elevate it or depress it. OK, because on this photo, in this diagram from Kaniski, you might feel that the examiner is actually elevating the eyebrow. No, it's just you press the eyebrow against the bone. OK, and here we are measuring the excursion of the upper lid. So the patient is looking down, place zero here at the margin of the upper eyelid. So you place the ruler like zero at the margin of the upper eyelid. Important to keep the ruler still, your hand still. Okay. And then ask the patient to look up and measure how many millimeters is considered the upper eyelid excursion. And again, you have to uh, mention the number in millimeters and mention the grade. Is it good or fair or poor? All right. And that's why I said here upper eyelids, because everything you have to do it on both sides. I drew this um, icon because you might feel that the eyebrow is elevated. No, you are not elevating the eyebrow. You're just pressing the eyebrow against the bone. And during the editing of the previous class, I found this photo a bit confusing uh, because uh, you might think that we place the ruler at the lower lid margin. No, it's not that. We place the ruler at the margin of the upper eyelid, okay? But on this photo, actually the upper eyelid, while the patient is looking down, while the patient is looking down, the upper eyelid margin is co-opted with the lower eyelid margin, okay? So again, we place the ruler at the margin of the upper eyelid and then ask the patient to look up and measure the amount. Okay, it might be confusing, but here the difference should be regarding the upper eyelid margin, okay? The excursion of upper eyelid. We don't care about the lower lid at all here. And uh, we commented on this photo because there is some error because the examiner here, actually, uh, there is a change in the position of the ruler because the lid margin here is not exactly at three, but here it's exactly at three. So there is a shift, a slight shift in the placement of the ruler. And that's why it's really important to keep your hand still, all right? And another issue here is like general advice. Don't go to the exam with long nails. First of all, um, regarding hygienic measure, this is like anti-hygienic thing. And also, um, you may hurt the patient. And we have like, we have finger near corneal abrasion. So you have to be careful that you might hurt the patient by your long nails. Even if they are clean and polished and, and so on, but keep your nails short. Uh, I brought this image, uh, this is a, like a new image, and I'm sorry, I'm, I don't remember the reference because it was taken from one of my old presentations. So this is like exactly the most correct photo, because here, you see, here the, the child is asked to look down, and here, uh, let's say the mark is here, at this area, and then the patient or the child is asked to look up, and now the mark is here. And there is no change, 
you know, there is no change in the position of the ruler. If you look carefully, yeah, almost there is no change. Uh, if I ask you what is the uh, amount of levator function here or what is the upper lid excursion in such a case? Yes, 10 millimeters. And I said before, you have to mention the number and the grade. Okay, so what is the grade? So this is a test of your memory because I, I already show you, uh, yeah, it's fair levator function. Here I wrote this uh, photo is genius. Okay, why? As you can see here, the examiner is, you know, negating the action of frontalis muscle and holding the rule by thumb. He used it like one thing to do two mechanisms, like he or she is holding the rule and at the same time pressing on the eyebrow. And that's why I call this photo genius. Okay, I have one more important thing here, like something, something basic. Why we, when we are measuring the levator function, why we ask the patient to look down? Because we are going to measure the levator function. So whenever we are trying to measure a function of a muscle, the starting point should be the complete relaxation of the muscle. So when the patient is looking down, the levator muscle is completely relaxed. And then you ask the patient to look at extreme up because this is like a maximum action of the levator. So whenever we have, we are testing or assessing a function of a muscle, we start by the maximum relaxation of the muscle and then the full action of the muscle. So we are, if we are going to test flexion, for example, of our arm or the range of movement of elbow, we start with from the extended position to the flexion position, for example. And by the way, we can assess this by something called goniometer, and we use it in strabismus, by the way. This um, device is called goniometer to measure the angle. We use it to measure the head tilt and chin uh, up or chin down or face turn. So in strabismus, we use this device to measure how much angle is present in the case whenever we have an abnormal hip posture. So this is a basic, we, we measure the upper head excursion from the complete relaxed position to the full action of the levator muscle. But at the same time, we need to mitigate the action of frontalis and, what, and that's why we place our thumb on the eyebrow because this is the insertion of frontalis muscle. And whenever we fix the insertion of the muscle, we prevent it from its action, all right? Last point in the revision about the lid crease, uh, I said you might ask the patient, you need to ask the patient actually to look a little bit down in order to see the crease, the fold. And sometimes you may retract the lid margin upward a little bit to see the fold and then measure the distance of lid crease from lid margin. But most importantly from exam point of view is to comment on the lid crease. Is it like present, like in this photo, present? We have a ptosis, but we have present uh, lid crease. This is a case of congenital ptosis. Or is it absent, like in this case, bilateral? Are there any stitches in this photo? Here, scar. Or we have like high crease here, like in involutional ptosis or apneurotic ptosis. Now, this is the beginning of our class. We finished revision. So what's the next one in the assessment? It's really important one, corneal protection mechanisms. Those who have attended the proptosis evaluation, what do I mean by corneal protection mechanisms? Whatever can uh, prevent exposure keratopathy, like Bell's phenomena, lag of thalmos, the corneal sensation, and finally corneal staining on a slit lamp. So you said four points. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, any more? Any more additional points? So, uh, bills number one, lag of salmus number two, corner sensation, staining number four. So, lid lag. What do you mean by lid lag? Uh, the lid uh, will be when the patient is looking down that time, the lid will not relax fully. And okay. uh, the palpebral aperture will be more in the down gaze as compared to the normal eye. So, it will be more in the totic eye. So since it's relaxing less than the other one, there is yeah. chance that post surgery also there may be yeah okay. chances that he may have exposure. I got it. Uh -huh. I got it. So usually when we say lead lag, you have to say lead lag on down gaze. Okay, uh -huh. and if you notice here, 
lead lag on down gaze, we usually write it like this. Okay. Mm. I may add it to corneal protection mechanism, but actually I didn't write it down. But uh, whenever you say lead lag, you have to say lead lag on down gaze. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's about the dynamics. We care about the dynamics of the eyelid on down gaze also to protect the cornea. Okay, let's watch the video first. So every one of these, you have to know the steps. Now I started here by testing for bells. I said that before in proptose evaluation, but it's a kind of revision. So this is my way, okay? As you can see, I am trying to holding both upper and lower eyelids apart on both sides. Uh, I prefer to do the test on both sides at the same time because this is a good chance to make comparison. Because uh, be previously when I asked some of you to make assignments, about how to test Bell's phenomena, they test like one by one, like start by the right side and then by the left side. Okay, but I prefer to do it both at the same time because you need to compare. This comparison is always good. So again, you hold the eyelids apart and then ask the patient to gently, gently close their eyes and notice the result so as you can see here both corneas like are hidden under the upper eyelids so notice any the upward and outward movement of eyeballs so once more you hold the eyelids apart and then ask the patient to look uh, sorry ask the patient to close their eyes or let's say close their eyelids but usually we say close their eye so this is how we test the Bell's phenomena. So once more, uh, I wrote it down because sometimes it's confusing. So lift the upper eyelids. In some references, you may find, uh, or some practitioner, just um, holding the upper eyelid, like retracting the upper eyelid alone. But as I said, this is my way. I use also the lower eyelids. And uh, I prefer to use both like bilaterally at the same time. Instruct the patient to close his eyes. It should be here, eyes, gently. I discussed this before because in many references, you will find forcibly. But if we have a patient with normal tone of orbicularis, if you ask them to forcibly close their eyelids, it will be hard for you to open the eyelids. And what is the normal result? The globe will rotate upwards and outwards and the cornea uh, shall be covered by the eyelid, the upper eyelid, of course. What is the implication? If the patient doesn't have a good uh, Bell's phenomenon, this is considered as a relative contraindication. So be cautious when you are correcting to this. You may aim for under correction, and you have to keep an eye on the cornea, of course, postoperatively. And if it is like very poor Bell's and there is like associated other risk factors, like uh, the patient also have defect in sensation or um, other risk factors or bad cornea, the surgeon may be like contraindicated at all. So this is the implication or the significance. Not point here, uh, if the patient has Bell's palsy, already the patient has poor orbicularis because of facial nerve palsy, lower motor, of course. You may ask them to close their eyelids forcibly. And in such a case, you will test the tone of the orbicularis and do the Bell's at the same time. Okay, so I'm trying to like, Put two skulls together because in some references it's written that to ask the patient to forcibly close their eyes, but in other references they don't say anything. But according to my experience, we usually ask the patient to close their eyes gently in order for us to hold the eyelid apart in order to overcome the tone of orbicularis. I discussed this more in proctose evaluation classes. For example, if you are going to comment on this photo, is it good Bill's phenomena or like poor Bill's phenomena? Good. Good, yeah, because yeah, you can see the cornea, it's completely hidden. Someone asked in previous proptosis classes about the grades, so I made some illustration here. So there are different ways to classify Bill's phenomena. So we have good and fair and poor. So good if the cornea is completely covered or like more than two thirds of the cornea disappears under the upper eyelid, like in this photo. Even if we have a small part of the cornea is visible, like less than one third, it's considered good bills. 
fair. We have like a range between one third to two thirds of the cornea disappear. And lastly, poor uh, Bell's phenomena if less than of the cornea is only covered. So as in this photo, small part of the cornea is is covered, but most of the cornea is visible. So this is a poor uh, Bell's phenomena, or might be absent at all. There is no Bell's. Okay, there is no Bell's. There are some variation. Uh, like if you are interested to know them because uh, we have a question about this before uh, there is something called the reverse bells so reverse it means the eye moves downward not upward and we have inverse so the eye move upward and inward instead of upward and outward so normally the globe should move upward and outward but if we have upward and inward this is called inverse and uh, we have like perverse if they have like a bizarre uh, direction of the eyeball but this is like a fancy stuff for me but i brought them because um, some asked about them before of course reverse is dangerous because if we have a reverse and the eyeball is moving downward this is a risk for exposure after to the surgery okay so this is one of the questions what's the significance of other types of bills for me it's a kind of documentation but be careful if it is like a reverse, like the eyeball is moving down, this is a risky case. And this is my answer for this question. And I said this before in my video for testing the facial nerve palsy. Uh, when I asked the patient to forcibly close their eyelids, as you can see here, I got uh, reverse bills. You might need to go back to that class about Bell's phenomena in proptosis classes. So while I was testing for Bell's, but I gave the patient a wrong instruction. I asked him to forcibly close his eyelids. I got reverse Bell's. But later on, when I asked him to gently close their eyelids, I got normal Bell's. Okay, and that's why I'm telling you, whenever you want to test for Bell's phenomena, ask the patient to gently close their eyelids. All right? So this is number one one of the tests for corneal protection mechanisms, which is Bell's phenomena testing. The second one, so what do you think, what I'm doing right now? What do you think? I ask the patient to gently, again, gently close their eyelids or their eyes. And I extended his neck a little bit and then observed him. Yes, exactly. Here I'm testing lag of salmos. So whenever you want to test lag of salmos, again, your instruction to the patient should be clear. You ask the patient to gently close their eyelids and see if there is any gap or incomplete. So what is the meaning of lag of salmos, by the way? Incomplete closure of the eyelids. And some of my professors also add incomplete closure of the eyelids with gentle closure of the eyelid okay so gentle closure is really important in your instruction so i asked him to gently close her eyelids or their eyes and observe any gap in the fissure and to make it clear i might need to extend his neck to better visualize uh, this area to better visualize any opening here how we can document this volunteer doesn't have there is no lag of salmos bilateral. So we need to check bilateral. No lag of salmos. How about this photo? This is a patient who underwent uh, a surgery, to the surgery, maximum levator uh, resection. And this postoperatively, here is a scar of the levator resection. This is a scar of the previous surgery. This child is asked to gently close her eyelids. What is the finding? Lag of thalamus. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, right side. But actually, she has lag of thalamus bilateral, but more on the right side. And you can appreciate also peaking of the upper lid. The lid margin is not regular. This is one of the complications of toilet surgery. You might get a regular contour of the lid margin. Why I said bilateral? Because if you extend the neck with extension of her neck, you will find, but actually, I don't have a photo for her. Uh, while she is extending her neck, it's something like worm's eye view. Remember worm's eye view in protose evaluation? If you do worm's eye view for her, you will notice some gap in the left side. So she actually has bilateral leg of salmos, but more evident on the right side.
Okay, some learners might be confused and say that while studying Lago Salmos on references, we usually see pictures like this. And in the picture like this, you will see that the patient actually is asked to forcibly close their eyelids because here there is like a forcible closure of the eyelids. And we usually see the comment below the slide, there is lack of sum of the right side. So again, uh, in some references, whenever they are talking about lack of salmos, they usually bring a photo like this. So learners might think that in order to test lag for lack of salmos, we need to ask the patient to forcibly close their eyelids. But this is actually not correct. In order to test for lack of salmos, we need to ask the patient to gently close their eyelids. But since this is a case of Bell's palsy, Okay, and usually in Bell's palsy, if you ask the patient to gently close their eyelids, there will be a lag of salmos. A second step in evaluation, the examiner might ask the patient to forcibly or should ask the patient to forcibly close their eyelids to test for the tone of the orbicularis on both sides. And if we have like severe Bell's palsy, like severe weakness of the orbicularis, so even with forcible closure of the eyelids, there is still lag of salmos. So this is like a severe case of weakness or paralysis of orbicularis that we have like lag of salmos even, even with forcible closure of the eyelids. I don't know if you got my point or not. So again, basically for testing lag of salmos, we ask the patient to gently close their eyelids. If we, if we get like lag of salmos, we may ask the patient to forcibly close their eyelids to see if the lag of salmos will disappear or not. In such a case, the lag of salmos is still present, still present even with forcible closure. This means that the orbicularis here is very weak because of the Bell's palsy. All right? Uh, this is a tricky question. What is the difference between this photo? I already answered this photo. This is actually a patient with uh, Bell's palsy. And here's the examiner, actually my former professor. He asked him to forcibly close their eyes. He couldn't do on the right side, and there is lag of salmos even with the forcible closure. But how about this one? This is from a reference. What is the difference between this photo and this photo? Again, there is closure of the eye on the left side, but the right eye is, is opened. Do you think they are the same? Or this one thing and this is another thing? Take it to the blepharospasm on the left edge. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But you know, uh, spasm, if you say blepharospasm or spasm, so there might be something uh, like red eye or something like this. Okay, let's give you another clue in order to reach the diagnosis. How about now? What's your diagnosis? Hemifacial spasm. Yeah, exactly. So this is a hemifacial spasm. And see how it's important to check the face as a whole. So we mentioned Bell's palsy. Uh, sorry. So we have to discriminate between Bell's palsy and Bell's phenomena. Totally different <clears throat> entities. Okay. So we mentioned number one, Bell's phenomena. Number two, lag of salmos. Number three, here, what I'm doing. I'm just testing the orbicularis in general, like um, the, the tone of orbicularis, okay? This could be added to corneal protection because uh, if you have facial nerve palsy, uh, you might expect weakness of the orbicularis and you might expect also lack of salmos and so on. I covered this before, I think in Viva practice series, I don't know, I can't remember. If you are going to test the orbicularis, you ask patient to forcibly close their eyelids and you try to open them, normally you can't, okay? In normal subject, you can't open the eyelids because orbicularis are very powerful. And also, you may see bearing of the eyelashes because of the tone of the orbicularis. Here, by the way, what is the significance of testing the facial nerve in ptosis? So what is the importance for testing facial nerve in cases with ptosis? Number one, as I said just now, uh, facial nerve palsy, there might be weakness of orbicularis and lag of salmos and risk of exposure uh, after tooth surgery. This is like number one. Number two, what is the significance of testing the facial nerve? Number two, uh, uh, yeah, it might cause brow ptosis. Brow ptosis is one of the uh, causes of pseudotosis. 
okay number three this is another importance suppose we have like this is like, like an imagination if we have like severe ptosis okay severe ptosis with poor levator function imagine this scenario you have severe severe ptosis with poor levator function plus lower motor neuron lesions uh, facial nerve palsy what is the surgery what is the surgery of a choice in such a case yes exactly so frontalis we can't use frontalis suspension because the frontalis already is not working so we need to do what so still your answer is not complete okay the patient is suffering like the patient has severe ptosis poor levator function and what is the option here maximum levator resection so maximal levator resection is an interesting surgery that uh, some oculoplastic surgeon still do it even if we have poor levator function. So e even if we have poor levator function, we still use it and they call it internal sling. So for maximal levator resection, actually we are not strengthening the muscle because the muscle is already poor, but it actually is a kind of a leash or a sling to elevate the eyelid, the upper eyelid. Another uh, tricky question, what's the difference between this photo? So again, in this photo, I'm instructing my volunteer to forcibly close their eyes. So what's the difference between this and this one? So you said bilateral blepharospasm. spasm. So do you know a name of a syndrome? Uh, there is a syndrome, like specific name for this. Meek yeah. syndrome. Yeah, excellent. All right, so... We cover so far what builds phenomena, lag of salmus, or bicularis testing, and this is not like number four. This part is not edited at all, but here, as you can see, I am before doing such tests, uh, I refresh my like this infection measures. So uh, I applied another quantity of cleansing gel because I'm going to. Touch, uh, indirectly touch the. Uh, yeah, so this is like a hidden. There is a hidden test here, but uh, I'm ask, still asking you. What do you think? Uh, what I'm doing uh, behind this bar? Yeah, because yeah, wisp of sterile cotton. Yeah, to testing for, yeah, yeah, cornea sensation. Testing cornea sensation is important in oculoplasty uh, because this is uh, important before surgery because actually absent cornea sensation is considered a contraindication for tosis surgery uh, because there is no cure. Um, sometimes there is no cure for it. And uh, an important instruction to the patient that we need to ask the patient to look away from this uh, wisp because we are testing what the afferent, which is a trigeminal nerve. But if the patient is looking at the, this wisp, uh, the afferent would be the optic nerve. Okay, the reflex is the afferent should be trigeminal and the afferent should be orbicularis, the facial nerve. And try to touch the cornea and not the eyelashes. But here, actually, I, 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 I touched the eyelashes, but I, I didn't repeat it because uh, we are acting. And we are, this is not a real case. And you have to do the same on the other side uh, look to the other side and try to touch only the cornea and notice the reflex uh, closure of the eyelids. So this uh, ensure integrity of the afferent and both afferent and afferent. So testing cornea sensation is actually a technique. Uh, it has a name. It's called what? Esthesiometry. Esthesiometry. And what I'm doing actually is a kind of quantitative or qualitative assessment it's qualitative assessment but there is actually a device called esthesiometer so esthesio, esthesio means sensation and if you remember anesthesia is like the negative so esthesiometer is a device used to measure to, to give like quantitative assessment of the cornea sensation cornea sensation you are not allowed to, uh, to do this on the exam because this is like an invasive procedure also staining and tear break up time 
So these are another points related to corneal uh, protective mechanism. You have to check the tear film quality because tear film is important for the cornea. So corneal staining and tear breakup time are also important before to the surgery in real practice. So this clip is about uh, um, tear breakup time. Yeah. So adjustment of the machine uh, is important. So in um, anterior segment station, you have to adjust the IPD and be careful about the refractive. Uh, it might be defocused. So you have to check the device before starting the examining the patient, before starting examining the patient. Um, and if you have any problem, you have to um, mention this to the examiner early. So here I'm using fluorescein strips, okay? And uh, since the fluorescein strip is going to touch the ocular surface, the conjunctiva, or the palpebral fissure, or what is the palpebral conjunctiva, we need to apply uh, topical anesthetic eye drops uh, before it. And try, and also you need to moist, moisture, um, moistened, use moistened uh, fluorescein. So I don't know if you have noticed or not, is the uh, fluorescein strip is a tough paper, so you you try to make it a little bit moisture, okay, by uh, topical anesthetic eye drops as well. Because this strip might cause ab abrasion uh, in some patients with fragile epithelial surface, and then we need to use the blue filter. Cobalt blue fold filter, and uh, of course you know better than me how to assess uh, break up time. And again, this is in our practice, not in the exam. Nobody will ask you, but uh, you can test uh, for break break up time, and at the same time look for any staining. Okay, and when it comes to cornea staining, we have two another important stain, which is rose bengal. And rose bengal has an additional advantage over fluorescein that it can stain devitalized epithelium like in case of viral ker keratitis. But the uh, one issue regarding rose bengal is that you have uh, to apply topical acidic eye drops first because uh, it's mandatory because it's an, an irritant dye. So as you can see here, the points in order under the heading of corneal protection mechanisms, the first three, three you can do it in the exam because they are non-invasive like Bell's testing, lag of Salmos testing, and Urbicus Equilite testing. But the other, uh, the remaining are like invasive. We use it only in our clinical practice, testing coronary sensation, staining, break up time, Shurmur test. And I may add also lid lag on down gaze that one of you mentioned. Uh, we covered now, we completed this uh, point, corneal protection mechanisms. Shurmur is uh, also added, as you can see, but I don't have uh, a clip for Shurmur test. Next point is evaluation for Marcus Ganju winking causes and other misinnervations. Can any one of you define what the meaning of Marcus Ganju winking causes before I show you the clip? So it says thin kinesis between the pterygoid muscle and the levator muscle. So the nerve supply of pterygoid uh, is becomes the same as that of uh, levator. Okay. Can you uh, add more to this definition? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Ghada, by in the Marcus Gunn of winking phenomenon, there will be an aberrant innervation. So uh, the nerve fibers will be misdirected. So as to the pterygoid muscle, will be misdirected to pterygoid muscles such that when the patient opens his mouth or uh, moves his jaw, the eyelids will retract. That's causing a jaw winking phenomenon. It is a nerve misdirection syndrome. It is a neurogenic etiology. Wow. and uh, basically connects the levator palpebrae superioris and the lateral pterygoid muscles. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other additional points? I'm almost the same. There is elevation of the rotic lid 
on stimulation of the ipsilateral pterygoids. Okay, you added ipsilateral. This, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So we can summarize. So doctor started by mentioning only the anatomical, like uh, she was talking about only muscles. Okay. But she didn't mention anything regarding the findings. Okay. But then doctor added findings like retraction of the upper lid with jaw movements. But still he was like missing some keywords. And then she specified the side of the muscle, like there is misconnection between the ipsilateral pterygoid with the levator. She added the keyword, an important keyword, which is ipsilateral. Okay, let's watch the video first and add some additional information. So uh, actually in real practice, we start by taking a history of this. So first we need to take history. If we have an adult patient, we ask them. If we have a kid, we ask their parents. While they are eating, while they are breast or bottle feeding, is there any change in the toes or not? Okay, so here uh, in this part, I was asking him and explaining to uh, the people around me about what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm, here I'm asking him, uh, is there a change? So uh, we are just acting, okay? And then sometimes it's easy to demonstrate to the patient instead of saying in words, okay? So actually I was like uh, asking him to do jaw movement, like uh, side movements of the jaw. So I demonstrate on myself and ask him to do the same. And you know, you need to notice any change while do such movement, any change in the uh, toes, all right? And... Um, Actually, sometimes in order to confirm or exclude the presence of Marcus, we may give the patient, patient something to eat or, you know, to uh, illustrate chewing movement and notice any change in the eyelid position. Because sometimes um, the retraction of the eyelid is evident with certain movement. It's not only side uh, movement of the jaw. It might be opening of the mouth. It could be chewing, okay? Uh, there are a lot of variation, okay? In the last clip, I'm showing you that I have already written everything that I'm going to do, and I hope you can do the same, at least at the beginning of your practice, until it's become like second nature in your mind. This is an old assignment, and nobody answered it correctly. So as you can see here, There is a difference in the palpebral fissure. And there is movement here of the upper eyebrow, uh, sorry, upper eyelid. But the patient is looking down. Uh, I was like tricking the, the candidates by asking the patient to look down. And here she is looking upward. Nothing changed uh, in, in the eyelid. But here, now if you disclose the lower, the lower part of face, now it's evident that this retraction it doesn't relate to look uh, down gaze. It's something happen happens with what the chewing. So this is a case of Marcus gun. But actually, I was hiding the mouse, and that's why nobody answered it correctly. They said uh, most of them said it's like a kind of apparent regeneration of third nerve. Here, I'm asking the patient to look down because on looking down, the lid retraction is exaggerated, um, not because of looking down, but because when you are looked down, it's supposed that the the upper eyelid goes down. But because of retraction with, with, uh, with chewing, the retraction is evident, okay? This retraction come, uh, happens with jaw movement, and it has nothing to do with looking down. But it's evident more on looking down because normally uh, w whenever we have a case of lid retraction and we ask the patient to look down, the lid retraction is, most, is more manifested. So actually this child was chewing on a gum. 
and why it is not evident uh, on up gaze because in up gaze normally there is the traction of the, normally when you look upward normally the bo both eyelids go back so if you have a lid retraction uh, it is actually hidden so one missed keyword from uh, doctor he mentioned that the upper eyelid elevate uh, with jaw movement but you have to say is it contralateral or ipsilateral if we have marcus gun the upper eyelid elevates with the uh, ipsilateral jaw movement or contralateral jaw movement? Contralateral jaw movement. Contralateral. Okay, it's contralateral. Okay. Okay. So. But muscles will be ipsilateral, but yeah, the movement exactly. will be contralateral. Yeah, exactly. Got exactly. It. Yes, exactly. got it. Thank you. But if we imagine this child has a Marcus gun on the right side, synchronesis is between the levator here and the pterygoid muscle here. So, epsilateral pterygoid. But this epsilateral pterygoid is actually, when it acts, like the action of pterygoid muscle is moving the jaw to the midline, to the opposite side. This jaw movement uh, to the left is created by the right pterygoid muscle. Or if we want to specify more, the right lateral pterygoid muscle. Because we have lateral and medial pterygoid muscle. Okay, let's fill in the gaps, uh, these points. The onset of Marcus gun is generally what? Yeah, and say congenital. We usually say congenital, okay? And the synchronesis is between which nerves? The third and fifth nerve. Yeah, the third and fifth nerve. So uh, the third nerve, you mean the oculomotor nerve, okay? Yes. And um, the fifth is fifth trigeminal. Nerve, mandibular division. Yeah, mandibular division of the trigeminal, yeah. More specific answer. Excellent. The upper eyelid elevates with? Ipsilateral, contralateral yeah, movement. contralateral jaw movement, and the levator muscle contracts with the ipsilateral pterygoid muscle. Yeah, ipsilateral, yes. excellent. Okay, so uh, we have here a link from CyberSight. So this uh, a short quiz, like a very quick quiz. We have a thirteen-year-old with unilateral ptosis, left side. A thirteen-year-old female. So as you can see, you can learn how to uh, document the findings, how to write down a case, like a case scenario. So a 13-year-old female presents with unilateral ptosis, as shown in the first picture uh, below. The second picture is with the patient's mouth open, but mouth is not shown here. The best corrected visual acuity is 2020 right eye and 2025 left eye. Yeah, there might some affection of vision in ptosis, mostly because of refractive error. So here. So this presentation is consistent with what type of ptosis? Is it? It should be neurogenic. Okay. Yeah, neurogenic. So, okay. Correct. So remember the slide that I shared before about the etiological classification? So Marcus Gunn is under the heading of neurogenic. So neurogenic ptosis is not only about a third nerve palsy and Horner. Okay. You can add now Marcus Gunn under the neurogenic causes. All right. And in this slide, uh, I'm just showing you different types of uh, job uh, movements. So here, opening of the mouth, and here, elevation of the upper eyelid, uh, because the tooth is on the left side. Here, contralateral jaw movement, because Marcus gun on the right side. And here, with other uh, movement, we can say chewing. And as you can see, because here the child is looking down, the retraction is much evident okay so here the baby while sucking on pacifier the lid retraction is evident on looking down why because normally when you look down both eyelids should should relax should go down but since we have retraction with the sucking the retraction is much evident it has nothing to do with down gaze because some candidate might, might think this is a kind of apparent regeneration of the third nerve and we have like little retraction of the upper eyelid with down gaze. No. The retraction he here is due to sucking, okay? Not due to downward movement. But if you have a, a case like this in the exam, you have to put it in a differential diagnosis because such picture may be, may be uh, due to apparent regeneration of third nerve because uh, some of the findings on this uh, apparent regeneration that on down gaze, the red did retraction and this actually called what? It has a name. This sign has a name. So do what? So do von, von Gravy sign. Yeah, so do Von Gravy sign. Thank you. 
and again this again uh, of Marcus gun on the right side and because of this with this movement there is attraction because of because we have may get different movement of the jaw there is attraction but if we if the patient is looking up normally when you look up both eyelids as I said retract so the retraction is not evident and this is how we communicate with patients with Marcus gun so in real practice whenever we have a case with Marcus gun we try to ex explain to them to try to camouflage, uh, to mask Marcus gun by avoiding looking down. So how can someone avoid looking down? By just make like a chin down position. Instead of looking down, make a chin down position to avoid looking down. Because on looking down, the retraction will be more evident. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, if the child is looking up and if he, she does some chewing, uh, the wink is not evident. By the way, it is called winking because why it is winking? What's the meaning of winking? It means there is a distraction. It's because the distraction here is momentary. It's nothing uh, all the time. The basic problem or the um, the main problem is stosis. Okay, but retraction is something momentary happens with jaw movements, and that's why it's called winking. All right. So this point is about Marcus gun. We finished it. But do we have other misinnervations? Yes, like this one. Here I, I wrote down on this slide, turn on your imagination. I want you to describe all the findings on such a case. So this is a color photograph of a young female. Uh, there are three photographs. It's a collage on the, from starting from the first image on the left. The eyes in primary show uh, ptosis of the right eye. Uh, the middle image shows uh, increase in severity of the ptosis on abduction. On, dext on dextroversion and the uh, last image shows uh, improvement of the ptosis the ptosis uh, reduces in on uh, uh, levoversion or adduction of the right eye so this is suggestive of an inverse duan syndrome you said only on this photo ptosis on the right side you mentioned the side right yes you mentioned the side so right and uh, have you mentioned the degree like uh, like a rough idea no was no uh, so you can the, see the corner reflection. So you can see it's like moderate, okay? Moderate. If I were you, I would say moderate. And by the way, this is like an additional information, but it's not required as all. If you notice also, there is like uh, high arched eyebrows. Okay. So mm, maybe, I did not notice that. Oh, yes. uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe if we mitigate the action of frontalis, this moderate toses may become severe. So, hmm. because it's almost, you know, it's almost uh, just above the coin reflection here. But maybe yes, if we uh, mitigate the action of the frontalis, it might become severe. And if you notice on the other side, there is contralateral attraction. This is a compensatory mechanism. All okay. right. But this is like an additional for you, for yourself. Okay. Don't waste the time, uh, the exam time on mentioning this. And then... You said on right gaze, and you said dextroversion, dextroversion. Yes. So if we are in a strabismus, in strabismus classes, you may interest to say dextroversion. But in such a case, it's better actually to say on uh, abducting right. the left right. eye. Oh, sorry, the right eye. Because the problem is on the right side, okay? So on abducting okay. the right eye, because you already know the diagnosis. So you try to uh, mention... The, the finding as it is written in the book, you know, yes. on abducting the right eye, the toes gets worse. Okay? Yes. All right. And it's better. Actually, it's not better. It's like almost, almost not there. Yes. So here on abduction, you know, you can appreciate also the eyebrows is becomes a normal level. Like here, if you compare the eyebrow here, it's yes. like you come in the same line with the other one. Yes. All right, but so what? What is the summary? What is the summary? The uh, tosis improves on on adduction. adduction. How about the adduction itself of the right eye? The right eye adduction. Yeah, it does uh, seem to be M limited. Mild, yeah. So uh, yeah. so mild interaction. Yes. Mild. So what is your diagnosis? Your your Provisional diagnosis. And you said inverse, so you said inverse twins, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I expect to 
to this answer after but you didn't mention the diagnosis because inverse doing is a sign but okay yeah it's a you third nerve disdirection syndrome man. so we usually say a current regeneration of the third nerve of course on the right, right side and can you explain more because uh, on adduction there is firing of the medial rectus okay and right uh, there is firing to the elevator at the same time so there is firing of to the elevator with the medial rectus and the tosis gets improved excellent right and you can add here inverse duane because duane we have the opposite yes we can say there is narrowing of fissure or like somehow tosis on adduction in duane so this is called inverse duane sign and not syndrome Right. okay excellent So what's the next point? Uh, we have myasthenia gravis and myotonia. So I'm showing you the clip right now and we have some uh, tests and I will stop after each one and ask you what is the test. So what is the test? Testing for muscle fatigue. Yeah, fatigability testing. So actually... Pain torch is not required, but sometimes I use it as a target to encourage the patient to look at something. But you may ask the patient to just look upward and that's it. And see if there is worsening of ptosis. This is called fatigability test. The second test, I'm asking the patient to look down. Again, uh, Pintosh is not required, but uh, I use it as a target to encourage him right. to look down. So you may ask the patient to look down. And um, actually, I was placing my thumb on the eyebrow. And again, this is not necessary. So uh, after I asked him to look down for a while, I asked him to look at the primary position. Notice the primary position. And yes, to check for Kogan's lead twitching. Excellent. So what's the meaning of Kogan's lead twitching? Uh, you have to explain more. What's the meaning of this sign? I will mention it in the next slides. So this is the second test. So I am repeating it again. So you need to ask me to look down to relax the elevator. Uh, once it's relaxed, when you ask the patient then to Look at the prime position. Actually, the upper eyelid retract because the muscle is is now strong. But after retract retraction, it will drop again to the totic position. I will repeat it again. Don't worry. This is uh, like the third step or the third test for my senior gravis. Here I am asking the patient to forcibly close their eyelids for a while. What is the name of this test? Don't say orbicularis testing. I'm talking here about testing orbicularis in myasthenia. Okay, yeah, it's testing of orbicularis for myasthenia in, in order to show what? What is the sign? What is the sign? What is the sign? Okay, nobody answered. Let's go to the next one. I have like uh, iced water in two bags and I will, I will place it on the eyebrows, uh, sorry, the eyelids for like two minutes. So what is this test? Ice pack test. Yes. And make sure that uh, it's not too cold because it might harm the patient. And it should be like co-opted on the eyelids.
of course this is not relevant uh, from exam point of view because uh, but is this in your practice here two minutes about two minutes and after you finish you allow the patient to sit and remeasure the MRD1 and the of doses because uh, you have to document the findings before and after ice pack to to see if there is improvement or not and that's why I allowed him to sit again and measure the MRD1 and so on so in general, the ocular manifestation of mycenia gravis, we can categorize these manifestations into three big headings. Blepharatosis, uh, strabismus, and even the orbicular ocular can be affected. So regarding blepharatosis, we have uh, the fat fatigability test, sustained up gaze, Kogan eyelid switch. Do you remember in the previous class, we talked about c ptosis or enhancement of ptosis. You manually elevate the upper lid on the mortotic side and notice if there is worsening of ptosis on the other side. This is called seesaw ptosis. And this is important uh, when you are talking about mycenia gravis. It's commonly described. And ice pack test. Regarding strabismus, uh, mycenia can, is a great mimicker. It can cause any kind of, uh, of paresis, any kind of strabismus. And uh, when it affects the orbicularis, there is a sign called uh, peekaboo sign or peak sign. So uh, you will find uh, an, a wonderful video uh, on YouTube. Uh, so just type in YouTube, uh, yeah, like peekaboo sign or uh, or because weakness in Mycenae. You, you just type some keywords here and you will come up with a wonderful video that shows this sign. So simply you ask the patient to forcibly close the eyelids, okay? Uh, for a while, you will end up with what lag of salmus at the end. The patient can't hold uh, this tight closure for too long. So it's like peekaboo, you know, this uh, peekaboo game, the, the play game, or like the patient is peeking, like the patient is peeking or and opening their eyelids. So once again, uh, you ask the patient to forcibly close or tightly close the eyelids. They can keep it for a few seconds and then after some time, uh, you will find a peak or a kind of lag of salmons. Because in mycenic patient, we can't uh, provide sustained action of the muscle. So this is a demonstration of fatigability test. So here, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't remember the reference. The patient is asked to look up. And as you can see, compare A with the last one. There is worsening of the toes on the left side. This is fatigability test, sustained up gaze. So let's read it together. Ask the patient to look up and hold that position up to two minutes and then observe if there is fatigability of the levator muscles such that the upper eyelids start to drift downwards while the patient is looking up. And uh, this is actually Kogan's twitch. Uh, again, you, you will find videos on YouTube about Kogan's twitch. You can check them out. Just type Kogan's twitch. You will find uh, more than a video actually. But here it is demonstrated uh, in photos. So you have to relax the elevator by asking the patient to look down first and then look at the primary position. During the rest time, the elevator muscle becomes like stronger. So you will find retraction and improvement of the toes. This is a tutic side. Actually, this is uh, better than the actual toes. And after some time, the toes will drop again and you will see the baseline level of toes here. So it's simply Kogan twitch is what is a kind of improvement of toes after a short period of relaxation. So you relax the elevator and then ask the patient to look at the prime position. Toes is momentary improved and then it drops again. So it's like a, a kind of twitch because it's twitching or like moving down again to the drooped position. You will better understand it from a video actually, not from photos. From still photos, it's very hard to imagine. But this is a kind of dynamic test. What's the meaning of dynamic test? You have to momentarily notice the twitch. That the toes is improved for a little and then drops again. Or droops again. Uh, I showed you this slide before. I think in the previous class about how we do enhancement of toes. If we have a case, any case of toes. You manually elevate the totic side or the more totic side. And look for any worsening or change on the toes on the other side. And as you can see, there is a little bit worsening of toes on the right side.
So once again, let's read it together. Manual elevation of the mortatic eyelid decreases the muscle strength required to keep the eyelids elevated. So the contralateral levator muscle relaxes and causes worsening of toes. This is for positive results. If we have a positive result, the toes on the contralateral side will get worsened. And this is from Kaniski, the uh, ice pack test. We have toes here, and after two minutes, uh, toes improved. And this is suggestive of myasthenia. Let's talk about an important question here. How about pupils in myasthenic patient? Hmm. <clears throat> myasthenia basically is involved more with the external uh, ophthalmoplegia. The pupils are not affected. Okay, you have to make like sharp, sharp. Give me a sharp answer. Affected, never affected, sometimes affected. Don't say more or less. Give me sharp one. Unaffected, not affected. Yeah, it's not affected at all. Okay, not affected at all. So never ever there is affection of the pupils. Okay, actually when we are talking about myasthenia gravis, we are saying that it is a pupil sparing disorder. Pupil sparing, yeah means doesn't affect the pupil, okay? So if we have like any uh, ophthalmoparesis, like any kind of strabismus with limitation of movement, if we have affection of the pupil, uh, we don't consider myasthenia among the differential. So myasthenia is in the differential of pupil sparing ophthalmoparesis. Okay, let's uh, read it together. Ocular myasthenia gravis should be considered only in cases of painless, Pupil sparing of salmoplegia. So there is no pain in myasthenia. There is no pupil affection in myasthenia. You will find a lot of no, no T's in myasthenia. But myasthenia is an important topic in neuro classes, not in oculoplastics classes. So I'm, I'm just giving you a hint uh, today. So there is no pain. There is no pupil affection in myasthenia. So once again, myasthenia gravis should be in the differential of any painless pupil sparing of somnoplegia, even if we if we have no toses, so with or without toses. Why pupils are not affected? Because uh, myasthenia gravis affects only uh, skeletal muscles and not visceral musculature. And as you as you know, of course, uh, pupillary dilatation or any kind meiosis or dilatation, any uh, pupil size is not controlled by skeletal muscles. They are controlled by smooth muscles. And if you look for the definition of myasthenia gravis, you will find this statement. Myasthenia gravis is the most common disorder affecting the neuromuscular junction of the skeletal muscles. Okay, so this is a disorder of skeletal muscles, not smooth muscles. And that's why pupils are not affected. So since uh, champions are brilliant at the basics, so you need to know about some basics related to myasthenia. Um, I'm just showing you the slide. You can make a screenshot and you have to know a little bit about the basics, about the disorder, the mechanism or the pathophysiology in myasthenia. Myasthenia gravis is not an important topic. It's a very important topic. Okay. It's a very important topic. And you need also to study myasthenic crisis because you might be asked this question in the general medicine station, viva station. So you have to know the pathology. So can someone like give me a comment on this slide quickly? It's like here is a comparison between normal neuromuscular junction and myasthenic neuromuscular junction. But you have to already have the knowledge about the mechanism or the pathophysiology of myasthenia in order to describe this photo correctly. Yeah, it's a good photo uh, from Google search, but so what's the problem here in myasthenia? Ma'am, in the first picture, we can see that from the nerve endings, uh, there is release of acetylcholine, which then acts on the uh, receptors uh, at the uh, neuromuscular junction. And this will then lead to a contraction of that muscle. Whereas in the other picture, though acetylcholine is released, but it is not able to act on its receptors because those receptors are blocked by antibodies to those receptors. Excellent. Yeah. As a result of... Perfect answer. I couldn't ask for more than that. One more thing that uh, one uh, of my old assignments, uh, because my thenia is very important, but one of these assignments was about uh, this question. So let's hear it together. Uh, you will listen to the voice or the recording and tell me mm -hmm. about what are the questions. So just listen carefully because this is a mm -hmm. test for your listening skills. It's not an English okay. test, but it's uh, a 
practice to listen carefully to the examiner's questions. Let's try. In a voice note of at least five minutes, mention the ocular manifestations of myasthenia gravis in detail, including the investigations and medical treatment. The deadline is 48 hours. Okay. Can you say the, what she said? Um, in a voice note, in a max of five minutes. At um, least. Mention, in at least five minutes, mention um, the ocular manifestations of myasthenia gravis its investigations, medical treatment um, within 48 hours. Yeah, excellent. So you need to cover all these points. You may be interested to write down in your notes that myasthenia gravis is really, really important. You have to know the manifestations, investigations, because you know this is an auto autoimmune dis disorder. You have to know about the antibodies because it's important in the serology uh, investigation and how you mm -hmm. treat them. But by the way, there is an important title. We may talk about it in neuro classes, which is called uh, neuromuscular disorders in relevance to ophthalmology. So, for example, this photo actually, as we covered just now, is about the uh, pathology of myasthenia gravis. And this is uh, about the treatment, how we treat myasthenia gravis. We give the patient acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And we have also important topic in general medicine, malignant hyperthermia and important complications, although rare in strabismus surgery. So we have to know the mechanism of malignant hyperthermia and also the botox or uh, botulinum toxin, how it works on the neuromuscular junction. One more thing uh, before I shift to another, the next slide. If you see here the botox, it prevents what? It prevents the acetylcholine from the release, all right? In myasthenia gravis, we have generally there is nothing, there is no problem in the uh, acetylcholine release, but the problem in the receptor. So one of the previous questions in past canned experience, what are the contraindications of Botox? The answer is myasthenia gravis plus allergy to the Botox components. Is this important question actually? Because if you uh, give Botox to patient already have myasthenia, you are exaggerating the problem because now you give them additional negative effect. There is no release of acetylcholine and also there is defect in the receptors because the antibodies, the autoantibodies destructing the receptors. Uh, so this is uh, an important contraindication to Botox is having uh, myasthenia gravis. So someone may ask you why patient with myasthenia uh, is uh, looking for Botox because you know sometimes they have ptosis and as a compensatory mechanism, there is frontalis overaction and there is wrinkling of uh, like uh, corrugation of the forehead. So they might be interested in uh, relieving these lines, these wrinkles. So they may go for seeking a Botox. This is uh, usually the common scenario. And it happens uh, every now and then. It's not a rare occasion, unfortunately. All right. So this is regarding myasthenia gravis. So the next one regarding myotonia. There is one step only regarding myotonia here, uh, regarding hand grip. And this is exam an example of how wrong instruction or how it's really important to give correct instruction. Here I ask another assistant to shake hand my volunteer. But there is a difference between shaking hands and grip, hand grip, because shaking and shaking you are shaking. But actually, we are not looking for shaking hands. We are not looking for the grip itself, the muscle tone, the grip, and then relaxation after relieving the grip, the hand grip. So as you can see here, I'm, they are shaking, but I, I told him, no, no, no shaking. I just want the, the volunteer to tightly grip or hold the assistant's hand. Okay. And then I ask the assistant to check for the tone of the uh, or the power of the hand grip itself. Is it okay or not? Okay, I, I'm repeating it again. So once more, uh, I ask the volunteer to firmly hold the assistant's hand and then release. So you are looking for um, the relaxation after contraction because in myotonia there is what? there is uh, a delay on the re relaxation after contraction. And this is from Shoah. 
uh, it's a well known video. I'm sure you have seen it. Uh, this is a patient with mitonia dystrophy, with stosis, of course, with poor levator function. Anyhow. Just focus on the hand grip. So here, after there is, you see, there is really delay relaxation. The hand is still in the contracted form. This is like uh, one of the features of myotonia. Uh, the kind of make it easy. So Mark has gone. We have MG and myotonia graph is MG and myotonia is M. The next one is about motility testing. And whenever we say motility, you have to add strabismus evaluation, like doing cover tests and so on. So the following slides, uh, I will like quickly uh, mention the following slides because this is not a strabismus class. But you can see here, I added, if you remember in proptosis classes, I talked about motility, but I never mentioned the saccades. But here it's important to mention saccades because uh, if you study mycenia graphics, you may get limitation of movement on saccade testing. Because saccade testing is a kind of rabbit eye movement, testing for uh, rabbit eye movements. So in mycenic patient, the movement starts good and uh, then it fades away. Like, I think you can uh, read about testing saccades in mycenia graphics. And uh, here you will find lead lag on down gaze because in motility testing, we check the up gaze and down gaze, right? We check the up gaze and down gaze for the movement of the globe itself. But in the same time, we can also check for lead lag on down gaze. And if you notice, we mentioned lead lag on down gaze here in TOSIS evaluation. So because lead lag on down gaze is important sign, an important sign not to miss. Let's watch the video together. So here I'm testing what? So uh, it's a kind of revision because I said this in proptosis classes. So we usually start by testing version. What's the meaning of version? It means both eyes are open. Again, this is this is my way, and different practitioners have their own different ways. All these classes are just a guide, okay? It's a, it's a way to help you, but you already have other resources, our other mentors, and you have to come up with your own way in evaluation. So I start to buy horizontal testing because most of the time the abnormality is uh, in the horizontal testing. Okay. So here is, uh, I started, let's uh, repeat it again. First primary position and then I started by level version and de then dextro version. Uh, you can start by dextro version and then level version. Anyhow, the point is to start by testing the horizontal version. Okay. And then I testing, I tested what the diagonal position, like up on the right, up on left, down the right, and down the left. And whenever you test down gaze, okay, you have to retract the upper eyelid in order to watch the, the range, the range of movement. Because if you are testing down gaze, normally both eyelids will descend, will droop. So you need to retract, you are holding the upper eyelids in order to see the globe position. So down and left and then down and right, okay? And the last gazes to be tested on version is up gaze and down gaze. This is the up gaze. And this is for down gaze. So when you are testing down gaze to check the motility, okay, you have to retract the upper eyelid. You, are, you have to hold the upper eyelid. But if you are going to test for lid lag, you should not hold the upper eyelid because you are looking for lid lag once more. So if you want to check the movement of the globe downward, you have to retract the upper eyelids. But if you are going to test lid lag on down gaze that we mentioned in the previous class, you should not hold the upper eyelids. Okay. So since this is a volunteer, so uh, we have normal version. So once we have normal version, there is no need. There is no need for testing duction. Once again, if we have normal version, there is no need for testing duction. So there is no duction demonstrated on this uh, clip because uh, the patient already or the volunteer already has normal version.
اوكي and now I'm testing saccades because I said before saccades is important in ptosis in patient with ptosis because of myasthenia. So in uh, in saccade testing we need two targets. I'm here. I'm here. I'm using um, pen torch as a target, and and you, as you can see, we don't need light, and that's why I am I am placing my finger on the light. We don't need light. We need we need only targets. Okay. So I'm asking the patient to shift. their gazes like the gaze from right to left quickly so this is for horizontal saccades and be careful that the head should be stationary there is no movement of the head and this is for vertical saccades After motor testing, I uh, I did what cover testing. We usually start by doing cover test at near. Okay, so this is at near. First, I do cover test. And then I ended up with alternate cover test. By the way, you have to study the different types of cover testing. We have cover test and cover test and alternate cover test. Okay. And uh, it's not enough to practice on a volunteer. You need to practice uh, on real patients because you have to be familiar with different findings. If we have isotropia, exotropia, hypertropia, or if we have phoria, like isophoria, exophoria, or if we have like intermittent exotropia. So you have to be familiar with different scenarios. And that's why strabism is tricky because it's not enough to know the technique, the, the test. You have to be familiar with the different possibilities, different findings. So being attached with uh, someone like strabismologist, being attached with a strabismic clinic is mandatory before exam. If you are not a strabismologist, at least you need one month of observership in a high rate clinic, like with heavy patients. Now uh, I'm doing the cover test at distance. Again, cover and cover test. Uh, by the way, cover testing uh, is well written in canisty. And then alternate cover at distance. The patient doesn't have any phoria and, of course, doesn't have any tropia. Okay, if I ask you, sometimes we have cases with stosis and strabismus. Remember the close intimacy between strabismologist and oculoplastic surgeon? So uh, we can classify based on motility testing into patients with normal motility, like we have like committent, this is called committent strabismus, or defective motility, we call it incompetent strabismus. And of course, we have examples under this heading, and we have examples under this heading, but again, this is not a strabismus class. But uh, generally, uh, in your mind, try to classify the causes into two types. Ptosis with committent strabismus and ptosis with incompetent strabismus. Can you give me an example of ptosis with defective motility? Third nerve palsy. Chron chronic progressive external ophthalmoplasia. Excellent. What else? Third nerve syndrome. <laughs> okay. All right. My senior gravis. Yeah, excellent. Mycenia gravis. We already said that we have three ophthalmic manifestations of mycenia. Ptosis, strabismus, and orbicularis oculi affection. So, and we said that mycenia should be in the differential diagnosis in every case with strabismus, ophthalmoparesis, with or without ptosis. So, uh, I was waiting for third nerve palsy, actually, and mycenia gravis. These are the two important ones. And how about a common example based on your clinical practice? Common example of ptosis and strabismus. Can you give me a common scenario for having a patient with ptosis and strabismus? So uh, let's give you a scenario. And this is like a common scenario, unfortunately. So uh, if we have like a child with congenital ptosis and unilateral ptosis with a refractive error like anisometropia and not discovered, not corrected early. So the child developed... Uh, a kind of anisometropic amplyopia or amitropic amplyopia. And usually when we have poor vision, uh, a secondary consequence is secondary strabismus. So the child over time will develop exotropia, for example. So we have a kind of sensory exotropia because of uh, uncorrected refractive error 
and uncorrect error is a common association with congenital ptosis. Or maybe the ptosis, this congenital ptosis is like severe, it's covering the visual axis, and it's unilateral, and it's ignored, okay? Or there is delay in the surgical uh, repair. So the patient, the child developed sensory deprivation and pleopia, and then uh, as a consequence, he developed or she developed strabismus. So this is like a, a kind of visual circle we face every now and then in our clinical practice. So in such cases, the motility is normal because there is no paresis, no restriction, no, no other thing. It's a kind of a sequence. All right. So here I want to add important thing. Uh, be careful of pseudo limitation. This is actually important when we will talk about strabism in the future, in the far future. So what the, what the meaning of, what's the meaning of limitation, pseudo limitation? Pay attention to this slide. Imagine this is a case of exotropia. This is like a large exotropia. Here, I said here exotropia. So XT here, uh, this is the abbreviated form for exotropia. What's the meaning of exotropia? Like manifest divergent squint. OS means uh, left eye. And here I wrote 40. Why I said 40? This is a rough estimate because uh, in Hirschberg testing, as you can see, this patient is looking, if you imagine that the patient or this um, guy is looking at the pin torch, we have central coronary reflex here and we have decentered nasally. When the coronary reflection is decentered nasally, this means exotropia. Uh, Hirschberg test uh, can give a rough estimate of the angle of strabismus as well. Okay, so if the reflection is at the limbus, it's usually about 40 to 45 degrees. If we are going to test version, so like here, levoversion. So what's the meaning of levoversion? So version means both eyes are open. And levoversion, it means looking to the left side. Usually, uh, this patient will use this eye, like this will be the fixating eye, because it's, it's easier for him to follow the target on this side, okay? So usually uh, it's much easier for him to follow this target on the left side by this eye. The right eye apparently will show limited adduction once more. Okay, so let's imagine now here is the, the brain. Okay, this is a brain. And we ask the patient to look at the target here. So usually the brain will send like just a few impulses for this eye to become the fixating eye, like this area, just this area, like let's say one plus stimulation. And according to the Herring's law, another one, one just one plus will go to this uh, eye. So what is the end result? Uh, this eye becomes the fixating eye. This eye, the, the, the exotropic eye becomes the fixating eye, the fixating eye. And this eye... This eye moves a little bit, and it seems that it is has like limited adduction, but this is actually a pseudo limitation. How to verify? How we can verify if it, if it is like pseudo or true limitation? You need to cover the exotropic eye and ask the patient to look to the left. In such case, in such situation, the brain will send uh, enough impulses to allow the eye to move inward. I'm not going to repeat it. So, got it or not? This is called a pseudo limitation. So, as you remember, I said before, if we are doing version testing and you notice normal version, there is no need for testing duction. Duction, what's the meaning of duction testing? It means each eye separately. But since here in, in the middle photo here, we have apparent limitation of adduction, we need to cover this eye to check for the movement of the right eye. If it is full, it means that this is just an apparent or pseudo limitation. So next time you notice any patient with exotropia, you know, this is a common scenario, this is a common squint in my area. Like we have many patients with intermittent exotropia, like large angles. Whenever you test the version on the side of the exotropic side, you will notice apparent adduction defect on the other side. And on this slide, I'm um, just summarize some of the causes of ptosis with defective motility and strabismus. Here we have a table, as you can see, because third nerve is the most important. The second most important one is mycenografts.
All right, we have simple cause, uh, which is some case of congenital ptosis. If you study congenital ptosis, you will find that sometimes we have defective in the action of superior rectus. So patients with congenital ptosis may show uh, some limitation of the upgaze because uh, of under action of the superior rectus. But usually there is no uh, associated strabismus. Usually there is no uh, any kind of hypotropia or anything. It's just some weakness of the superior rectus. How about third nerve palsy? What is the misalignment? If we are going to fill, uh, fill in the gaps, like fill the blanks here, what is the uh, misalignment? What is the expected misalignment in third nerve palsy? The eye will be down and out. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's sometimes better to use the same language as strabismologists uh, use. So instead of down and out, you can say something else. Yeah. So it down and out is a, lay, is a lay person language. Hmm. Uh, it will be abducted. Abduct is a movement. It's not a misalignment. So what are the okay. types be, of... What are the, exotropia. Yeah. Exotropia. Exotropia and... Hmm? Little bit of hypotropia. 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 Yeah, I like a little bit because sometimes you don't see any hypotropia at all. So the basic misalignment is exotropia. Okay. And maybe some hypotropia, maybe not. But most importantly is exotropia. It's a kind of paralytic exotropia. If we are trying to fill in the gap, like uh, what is the misalignment in Monsignia Gravis, you can say anything, anything. If you are lo looking for more advanced information, you have to check uh, some disorders. So can someone at least uh, tell me the abbreviated, so like the name for each abbreviation, like the first one, second one, and third one? Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, monocular elevation deficiency, and uh, congenital fibrosis of the external ocular muscles. Yeah, I, I think you have to be familiar with these orders because it's written in Kaniski, but maybe monocular elevation deficiency is not written in Kaniski, so you have to make no some notes about it. It's written in American Academy everywhere, and it's important. Monocular elevation deficiency syndrome. All right, so I have some slides. So here, if you have a case like this by inspection or in a viva, in viva station, do you think this is a single diagnosis or a differential diagnosis? Okay, let's describe the findings first. Whenever you're stuck at the exam, try to describe what you are seeing, okay? So let's start by one by one. Left eye uh, ptosis. Right eye, uh, upper lid retraction. So let's say left side. Now we are talking about the left side. Okay, number one, we have ptosis. There is exotropia of 15 degree. And little hypertropia is also there. But sorry, uh, the patient is actually not looking at the camera, but uh, generally speaking, we have exotropia. So lift the vertical for the, a little bit. If the patient is looking at the flash exactly, it's like Hirschberg test. You can get good results. But since this patient is not looking exactly at the flash, so ignore the vertical misalignment, focus on the exotropia because it's very manifest. The patient is somehow actually is looking a little bit to the left. But uh, be assured there is exotropia here. So we have here ptosis and we have exotropia. And uh, it seems to me that the tooth is somehow severe because there is um, compensatory mechanisms manifested by contralateral retraction of the other side. Imagine now you are in uh, station, the viva station, and you mention to the examiner toothes and exotropia. Usually the examiner will ask you what is your diagnosis. Oh, first, we would like to check pupillary reaction. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. So pupil is really relevant. Actually, the pupil uh, seems normal. Okay, so you, you can say uh, to the examiner, uh, I need to check the pupil. Because you are thinking of what uh, third nerve, check pupil. The examiner will uh, imagine that the examiner tells you that the pupils are fine. There is no affection of pupils. And he is repeating his question again. What's your diagnosis? So sometimes the answer is uh, starts by this, check. Remember this, I want to check. So remember this phrase, it's very, really helpful. So I want to check. I want to ask the patient history in questions, for example. This is like a good opening if you are not sure. So I want to check pupils. How about I want to check motility? It 
it's going to be very helpful to reach the correct diagnosis. If I were you, I will say uh, I want to check motility if the motility is affected, like the adduction is affected, and also other motilities like elevation, depression, because you know in third nerve all motilities are affected except the outward movement. So I will say my first differential is third nerve palsy. And since the pupil is not affected, so it's like pupil sparing third nerve palsy. This is my first diagnosis. Uh, since the pupil is not affected, so I may think of my senior gravis because we knew, we mentioned that my senior gravis is in the differential of any pupil sparing of salmoparesis. But imagine if the examiner told you uh, motility fine, motility fine. Imagine this scenario, motility fine. You may think of associations, just a coincidence. Patient has uh, exotropia and ptosis. So this is how we answer. But usually this is like a remote scenario. And actually, this is a case of third nerve palsy. So the key answer actually is third nerve palsy. And pro most probably the examiner will tell you the motility is affected and this is third nerve, how you will manage such a patient. Okay, and so on. The importance of this photo is that you may be caught by the ptosis. So don't ignore the primary position. So always think of strabismus in association with ptosis. And another lesson we can learn from this photo uh, that sometimes uh, if you are not able to give a diagnosis or a differential diagnosis, you may start by saying, I want to check pupils, I want to check motility because I'm thinking of third nerve. Try to say something instead of giving the examiner a long pause. Sometimes in Viva, they may bring photo like this, like composite photo or collage photo. The most important one to focus on is the primary position. And usually uh, there is a kind of uh, arrangement. This is the primary position. This is the up gaze, down gaze. This is the version, dextro version, and then the diagonal position. As you can see here, the brain can't process uh, a lot of information at one time. So focus on one thing at a time. So here, uh, as you can see in the prime position, again, there is ptosis and uh, the examiner is placing a plaster or something to elevate the, the eyelid. So we have like severe ptosis and exotropia. So you may think of a uh, third nerve and then you have to check the horizontal movement. And as you can see, there is defective adduction. We have defective elevation. We have defective depression. If you are giving such a photo, you have a, to give the examiner a single diagnosis, not a differential. Don't say myasthenia. Uh, usually, we don't say myasthenia. This is like a classic example of third nerve palsy. Always keep myasthenia in the backup answer. Okay, Don't say it uh, in every single case. Uh, say it uh, whenever the examiner is looking for additional causes. But don't say myasthenia in such a case. This is a case of third nerve palsy. Head is tilted. If the examiner is asking about abnormal head posture, the, the photo should be in full, like not limited like this. In order to comment on head posture, the, at least the, the full head and neck should be visible and the upper shoulder. Again, whenever we have a case and uh, the examiner wants to comment on the head posture, at least the photo should cover the whole face and neck and the upper shoulder. But you can't judge on abnormal head posture in such a limited view. Okay, just focus on the finding. The finding is very manifest, like ptosis, exotropia, and limited movement by muscle supplied by third nerve. Uh, and you have you have to tell the examiner, I can't comment on the pupil because most probably the pupils are dilated, like pharmacologically dilated. If you see here, if we magnify uh, this photo, for example, the pupil here is di is dilated. So most probably the patient underwent pharmacological dilation. So you have to show the examiner that you are aware of pupil sparing and pupil affection in third nerve palsy and the importance of each of them. Okay, which one is the dangerous one? Pupil involvement. Yeah, pupil involvement. This is like an urgent case. Here is a question. If we have a case with exotropia and ptosis, like this patient, this is actually ptosis, and I don't know if you can see there is exotropia. Is it equal uh, third nerve palsy? No, we have, as I said, you have to consider mycenia gravis, or it may be just a mere association, just a coincidence. Patient has exotropia and ptosis. Um, Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Ma'am, isn't mycenia gravis generally bilateral, though it may be asymmetrical? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are you giving me a statement or are you asking? Mom, I'm uh, asking, I mean, uh, like when uh, the, the pictures that you showed, 
all of them had only one eye involvement primarily. So should we keep myasthenia in mind even if there is such a picture? Yeah, you are right regarding that myasthenia usually bilateral asymmetric. And that's why I told you keep myasthenia gravid in your mind. Don't don't tell the examiner about myasthenia until you feel that the examiner is waiting for another answer. Okay? So whenever we have third okay. nerve like toses with exotropia, focus on third nerve. Okay? If you think that the examiner is asking about additional cause, you can at, at that point mention myasthenia gravis. Okay? Uh, if you check references, you will see that you will see that ocular myasthenia gravis can present in different scenarios. As I said before, there might be ophthalmoparesis like strabismus without toses. Okay, without toses, can you imagine? Uh, and that's why it's very tricky at diagnosis. And even if you check the investigation for myasthenia, you will find a lot of exceptions and a lot of consideration. And sometimes it's very hard to diagnose a case of myasthenia. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. All right. So what's the next point? Pupils. Okay, so this is a kind of revision again, uh, but revision is, is always good. Pupils, we say pupils, not pupil. So pupils, uh, we check for anisocoria, of course, and ROPD. And what is the importance of iris color? So in proptosis classes, I didn't mention iris color, but here I'm mentioning iris color. What is the importance of iris color here in ptosis? Because of what? The Horner syndrome. Yeah, you can add congenital Horner or long-standing Horner, and you can add also hypochromia on the affected side, on the Horner side. Okay, and when you can see uh, in some references, it's better to evaluate heterochromia in daylight. Okay, not artificial light. So let's watch the clip together. So here I wrote three points. Uh, if you remember in an proptosis, I mentioned only two points, anisocoria and RPD. Okay. But here I added iris color. Iris is not a pupil, but pupil is created by iris. I involved iris color among pupil assessment. So um, in bright illumination, we check for anisocoria because you know anisocoria has to be checked uh, under both conditions, uh, bright illumination and dim illumination. So here in bright, you start by bright illumination, you check for anisocoria and you check for heterochromia. So you do two things, you do two points in bright illumination, check for heterochromia and check for anisocoria. Uh, that's why I, I inserted this vector sunlight, like bright. So two points to be checked in bright illumination, anisocoria and heterochromia. And there is no anisocoria and there is no heterochromia. And then uh, in dim illumination, you again check for anisocoria. Okay, and start doing the uh, testing for ROPD. Okay. And that's it. So again, uh, in bright illumination, we check for anisocoria and heterochromia, and then in dim illumination, we check again for anisocoria and do right uh, pupillary reflexes. The most important one is ROPD. Check for ROPD. Let's answer these questions because they are important. So if we have third nerve palsy, tell me about the anisocoria. Anisocoria will be worse in bright light. Okay. Do you have another another word for bright light? Another synonym for bright light. Can we use another expression? Illumination. It is a, a, a scotopic or photopic? Photopic. Okay, you can see photopic. Okay, stay with me. So, third nerve palsy is is it a, a parasympathetic palsy or sympathetic palsy? Third nerve will be a parasympathetic palsy. Parasympathetic. How about the pupil on the affected side? On the affected side, pupil is dilated and consensual reaction both are absent. <laughs> okay. Dilated, fixed? Dilated, fixed. What's the meaning of fixed? Fixed means uh, the pupil will not react uh, on a direct, direct reaction and as well as a uh, consensual reaction is also absent for the uh, affected eye. Okay. So no response to direct or consensual. We have here P. 
and we have T. How about Horner syndrome? It is sympathetic palsy, right? Yes. Okay. And the anisocoria is worse in dim light. Uh, dim light. And uh, we can Dark say light. scotopic. Scotopic. So uh, we can hear like S, and we have also S. And the pupil on and uh, the pupil in the affected side is the Horner pupil. What is the Horner pupil? Pupil will be constricted. So what is the other meaning for constricted? Like small or meiosis? So we can say meiosis or small. Myotic. Okay, so here, small. And how about light reflexes? If you shine light on the pu the Horner's pupil. The reaction will be present. Yeah, so it's not affected. So pupillary responses or ref like reflexes are preserved. Because, you know, in pupillary reflexes, we need only what? We need optic nerve and uh, parasympathetic. There is no rule for sympathetic here. So pupillary reflexes are preserved. How about accommodation? Accommodation will be present. Again, accommodation is present. Okay. So this is a kind of, this is important slide and you have to keep it in your mind. And this is a kind of mnemonics. So sir, parasympathetic, you have P and here P photopic. And if you imagine the pupil is dilated, is big, but big starts by B, but B is similar to P. And in Horner, we have sympathetic. So uh, anisocoronia is more is worse in scotopic, S, again S, and we have small pupil. The next one is about orbits, and already we covered orbits in four classes. Here in this clip, I'm just showing you uh, just the inspection part, like uh, Worms eye view and Nafziger eye view. And by the way, what's, uh, Nafziger is the name of the scientist, right? How about Worms view? What's the meaning of Worms view? Is the worm is a scientist? This is the Nafziger view, by the way. So actually, Worms I view, Worms is not a name of the scientist, but because I used to think uh, about that, uh, I thought it's, it's a name of a scientist, but actually, Worms I view is just an idiom. Uh, it's just an English expression. So imagine yourself as a worm. So worm is, is usually on the ground. So you are looking actually from uh, the ground side, from a lower position. The opposite of worm's eye view linguistically is bird's eye view. If you are looking from a high building, it's called a bird's eye view, bird's eye view. So uh, worm's eye view is actually an English expression and it can use uh, also figuratively to indicate um, a kind of uh, limited understanding of anything or lack of perspective. So worm's eye view it means looking from below. It's not a name of scientist. So as you can see here, I outlined motility and pupils and orbits. And if you remember, they are all connected. If you remember the connection between toses, motility, pupils, and orbits. The four points are closely connected. The last one is about others. It's not relevant in the exam. Uh, but whenever we have uh, some case of ptosis, we need to avert the upper eyelid. Why? Why we need to avert the upper eyelid? Because we have an... <clears throat> to rule out mechanical, mechanical ptosis. ptosis. To rule out mechanical ptosis, exactly. Um, all right. And whenever you avert... Uh, so here I'm actually... Part of the examination is to look to the upper pulbar conjunctiva and the upper cornix because there might be a pathology causing inflammation and edema and causing mechanical ptosis. And you have to do the same on the other side uh, for comparison. If you have a natural, you, still you need to do on the other side. And whenever you avert the upper eyelid, you have to return it back after you finish. And you have to hold a light source to inspect the conjunctiva. Actually, we sometimes do lid aversion on slit lamp. Uh, and sometimes you may need to double avert the upper eyelid by using the more retractor. So here in upper lid aversion, you can see only the palpebral conjunctiva. But in double aversion, you can check the, the upper fornix. And you need a tool for double aversion. So this is one of from CyberSight lectures. CyberSight uh, website has four lectures, wonderful lectures about ptosis. 
in this photo, uh, the speaker is talking about an acquired tooth in, in this lady, okay? And by a version of the upper eyelid, he found what contact lens slipped in the upper fornis, causing joint, um, causing papillary action and inflammation in the area. And that's why she developed this kind of inflammation and mechanical tooth. Of course, she, does, she doesn't need any uh, tooth surgery. And uh, this is from one of my colleagues, sometimes conjunctival cysts, because here in Egypt we have, um, still we have trachoma, and one of the sequelae of uh, trachoma is conjunctival cysts, and you can appreciate also scarring of the tarsal conjunctiva. So conjunctival cysts in the upper eyelid might cause mechanical tosis, you, so you need to avert the upper eyelid. So here, uh, this is one of pharmacological tests that we can use in patients with stosis. It's not related to Horner. So, you know, we have uh, a big topic about pharmacological testing in Horner, and you have to know them by heart, know these uh, tests by heart. But this is not related to Horner. So here, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so uh, suppose we have a tosis on the left side. Okay. And if you notice, I... I placed a plaster over the eyebrow because this is the affected side. We imagine this is the affected side. We place a phenylephrine um, and wait for a couple of minutes, like five minutes, and see uh, any improvement in toes. And again, you need to measure MRD1 before and after. Okay, this is an Arabic, but actually it's phenylephrine. So the concentration... According to the description, the concentration should be 2.5. Here in Egypt, we have 10%, so we have to dilute it. But the concentration is in percent, uh, 2.5. And what is the significance if there is improvement of the tosis by about 1 to 0.5 in case of mild tosis, of course. This is an indication for a, a wonderful surgery called Muller's muscle conjunctiva resection. And again, this is a screenshot from one of the lectures of CyberSight. Uh, and as you can see here, the speaker showing us the effect of phenylephrine test. So as you can see here, there is right tosis. And after application of phenylephrine 2.5% and waiting for 10 minutes, there is improvement on the right side. So this lady is a candidate for molar conjunctiva resection surgery. Also, he mentioned on the slide, this test may unmask contralateral tosis. So in, imagine it's like uh, the manual elevation of the eyelid, the seesaw toses we talked about earlier. If we get improvement of toses by phenylephrine, because we apply this drop only on the affected side, it might unmask contralateral toses. This is the checklist. And you know what? I may add to others pharmacological testing for Horner in order to remind you of the importance of pharmacological testing in Horner syndrome. So here I'm going to add pharmacological testing for Horner syndrome. How about routine ocular examination? You can give me an example. Uh, lens affection in a case with stosis. Yeah, like myotonia dystrophia may have cataract. And fundus examination like in Kern-Sire syndrome. How about systemic like uh, for cystic myotonia gravis or cystic manifestation of myotonia? These are some examples. And don't forget at the end to thank everyone, uh, not only patients, but also the examiner, like every uh, person. So, uh, and this is a good chance to thank again my volunteer and all people who helped me in shooting that video. Regarding the tools, uh, if you remember, I asked you before about the tools required in order to evaluate a case of ptosis. And you mentioned uh, five, but actually uh, the most important ones are pin torch and ruler. Regarding occluder and accommodation target, this is for strabismus evaluation. The other points related to the requirements that I needed before shooting the video, like having ice pack, like having soft tissue and so on. But for tools evaluation in the exam, you need two pin torches, as I said earlier, uh, ruler plus strabismus evaluation, Cluder and accommodation target. Now we finished the checklist. Now it's your time. It's over to you to practice all these steps to write down your own checklist and practice on a volunteer first and then on real patients. How about question of the day?
Someone asked this before. Good morning. One of the past experiences mentioned that the examiner was asking about the status of lower eyelid, okay, on down gaze in conjugal ptosis. Can someone please guide? Okay. I mentioned before that past candidate experience is a treasure. And you have to study them and to read carefully these experiences. But keep in mind, some of the experiences are not mistake-free. There might be some misunderstanding, all right, from the candidate side, or maybe there is a mistake in typing. So this question doesn't make sense to me. So we have two possibilities for answering such a question. The first one that the examiner was actually asking about congenital ptosis with down gaze. So there is only what do you expect uh, on down gaze in a case with congenital ptosis? And we answered this before. Uh, we said that in some case of congenital ptosis, due to this genesis of the levator muscle, we may have upper lid lag on down gaze. So the upper lid is lagging of the upper lid on down gaze. And we explained the reason. So this is like the question was about asking what you expect in some case of congenital ptosis on down gaze. The other possibility is that the question was actually uh, about the lower lid. Imagine that you have a case of congenital ptosis and there is a finding in the lower lid. So here the examiner might be asking about what congenital Horner syndromes because you know congenital Horner syndrome one of the causes of congenital ptosis and you know in congenital Horner we have also inverse ptosis where the lower eyelid is a little bit elevated so in congenital Horner we have upper and lower eyelid ptosis plus meiosis and so on so if we come across like a strange question do your best check the references ask your mentors okay but if you didn't get an answer move on so don't let any question paralyze you or slow you down in the process of studying. Here another photo from the American Academy about lid lag on down gaze. Uh, as I said before, this is a dynamic test. Lid lag on down gaze is a dynamic test. You ask the patient to look up and then look down. And you will find lagging of the upper eyelid. You see it's not covering the globe as on the other side, there is lagging of the upper eyelid. And that's it. That's the end of our presentation. Uh, the next time, the last class on toses, we will cover some cases based on past candidate experiences, causes, and some closing slides. We have an additional part in the next class. There is a contest or assignment. I will choose one of you or maybe one of you volunteer to be a black horse and the other one will be a white horse. Each one is assigned to do a PowerPoint presentation only of five slides. One sentence on each slide. Photos are recommended to be included. The maximum allocated time is five minutes. After five minutes, your shared presentation will stop. Black horse is going to talk about congenital ptosis and white horse is going to talk about inversional ptosis. Thank you so much for attending the class today. I hope you learned something new and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.